December 1920 and January 1921, an inquest took place in America inquiring into the conditions in Ireland which were being suffered by people during the War of Independence. This is the report of the evidence on conditions in Ireland. A number of notable Irish people went to America, 16 people, took them 10 days to travel there, and they gave their testimony as to how people were enduring the War of Independence. Five of the six women who travelled to America on that commission were from County Cork. Cork was the beating heart of the Irish War of Independence. The events in Cork had gained a lot of international recognition, uh, especially the assassination of Lord Mayor Tomás McCurtain and then the subsequent hunger strike of his successor, Terence McSweeney, and the other prisoners in Cork Men's Prison. So there was kind of an international recognition of events in Cork, and Cork was kind of synonymous with armed resistance to the British. The purpose of the commission was really to highlight the British collective punishment policy in Ireland and to document British brutality and state violence against civilians primarily, but not exclusively. And it was really leveraging a, a similar kind of effort that had been undertaken by um, the British government to highlight German atrocities in Belgium in the First World War. So it was using kind of a similar style public hearing. Uh, it looked like kind of a, a government style hearing, although it wasn't using Washington DC as, a, as kind of a set. And it was to give credence to these documented cases of state violence that were really common in Ireland and to, and to introduce those to an international audience. Susanna and Anna Walsh began their testimonies in Washington on December 22, 1920. They had witnessed the assassination of Lord Mayor Tomás McCurtain earlier that year. Susie and Anna were the sister-in-laws of Tomás McCurtain, so they were known best, I suppose, because of that connection, but in actual fact they were very strong Fenians in their own right. Their forefathers had been uh, banned from Ireland. Their brother Tommy had fired the first shot in the Rising in 1916. So besides the fact that they were Tomás's sisters-in-law, they had very strong connections and a dream of a free Ireland as well. We think nothing of it now just going over to America, but for herself and her sister Annie to have to get a ship to America, leaving behind their sister, and my grandmother at that stage had lost the baby girls, and of course was going through a very traumatic time herself. The business was closing down, and they left to give witness to what they had seen the night of the murder. See, people in America didn't quite understand the auxiliaries and they didn't understand the atrocities. And of course, it was all compounded then because by the time they arrived in America um, to give a testimony on the, I think it was the 22nd of December, the Bernie of Cork had happened. So they were on the ship when it happened, but when they came ashore, they would have discovered a further atrocity that had gone on. They gave first-hand witness to the murder of their brother-in-law and as I've said before, a soldier expects to die possibly for his country, um, but that would be normally in uniform, not to be murdered in front of your wife, your children, his sister-in-law, Susie and Annie were in the house, and their mother. So they were able to sit in front of, we say, judge and jury and explain this is what went on. I think a lot of Americans have a great grow for Ireland and feel that it's really the homeland, which it is for many of them. And you had these two extraordinary women who had travelled halfway around the world to tell a story that touched their hearts and the tragedy that the auxiliaries had brought to Ireland and to Cork. So you'd want a heart of stone, I think, to sit and listen to women explain that their brother-in-law was shot in front of them, his wife, his pregnant wife, who later lost the twins, and his children. So, you know, it wasn't a performance they were putting on, they were just sitting, telling a very simple story of what had happened to them. Ms. Caroline Townsend, a native of my own town of Bandon, attended the commission on behalf of the Gaelic League, and this is her report to the commission. Despite all obstructive tactics of the English government, the people, through their representatives on local boards, turned naturally and enthusiastically to the native administration the creation of their own will democratically expressed. The machinery of the English government is idle, rejected by the people, 
the latest reports of the internal conditions of this boycotted institution are to the effect that its higher officials definitely despair of ever again regaining their control of local administration and are now bent on a course of obstructive and destructive tactics in the hope of wrecking local administration, thereby inflicting great hardships on the most helpless sections of society, the sick in the hospitals, the poor who are depending on outdoor relief, and the mentally unsound in the asylums which are maintained by the county councils. Caroline Townsend went on to say, many old standing fallacies in Ireland which have been carefully nurtured by British influence are now being exploded. Like the one that the country is entirely dependent on England and could not keep our population alive out of our own resources. The most pernicious of all, however, is the fallacy that there is an impassable gulf between Catholics and Protestants and that the interests of the different denominations are incompatible. So deeply instilled is this that we hardly realise it ourselves. The state of things is artificial and not really natural to the Irish people who, when left to themselves, are naturally free from religious bigotry or class snobbishness, two evil things which often run side by side. Frank Dempsey, chairman of the Urban Council of Mallow, testified that his town was burned by British soldiers on September 27, 1920. Those who were in the town, when the military came into the town and they started roaring, they started fighting, they started throwing bombs, you can understand the condition of the women and children in the town. They ran out of their houses in panic, they ran to the churches, they ran to the convents, some of them even ran to the police barracks. And the RIC men in the barracks actually did take in some of these women and children for shelter that same night. Some of them in the immediate neighbourhood of the fires ran into the cemeteries that are behind their houses. I hope that the great people of America will deserve the blessing of Ireland. We are prepared to give our evidence straight before any court, any commission, or before any people in the world. The facts are there. The facts of Mallow, as I gave them to you, are true. And the facts in other parts of Ireland are the same as I have given them to you. And we are not afraid to face any audience in the world with the evidence that I have given you. No country ever got her liberty without a certain amount of suffering. And we as Republicans, the majority of the people in Ireland, 90% of the people in Ireland, I should say, will go to the end through any amount of suffering until we get what you people here in America have got, your liberty. The American Commission was set up around November of 1920 specifically to look at events in Cork and in Ireland on a broader perspective as to what was happening there from 1919 on into 1920. And Mary and Muriel were invited to go on that basis because of their connections to Terence McSweeney and how they could give really heartfelt witness testimony to what had gone on in Cork in 1920. When Terence McSweeney died, it was vitally important to continue the momentum of the campaign. That was why, a month after his death, his widow and his sister were on the boat to America. US support from Irish America was the key to our independence movement. They had helped to plan, fund and support our movement. When you think about it, he dies in October and somewhere in November she's asked, would she go on a tour to America? Dev makes this call to her and says, I need you here. We can, you know, we can make, you know, that his death won't count for nothing. We can make something of this. I need you to come and tell, you know, the Americans what's going on in Ireland. And it's Arthur Griffith that she turns to and says, look, I, I'm really unwilling about this. I'm really not comfortable about this. And it's he who says to her, I know, but you need to do this. And you need to take somebody with you and I'll have somebody on the other side look after you. And that's how Mary gets to call because she asks Mary, will you come with me? And Mary agrees they would go together. That was a huge question to ask anybody and a huge sacrifice to ask them to do. 
these two women brought a spotlight onto the American Commission that I don't think even they had envisaged. Thousands would turn up when they would turn up for their evidence. They'd have to have bodyguards or a guard, you know, a police escort in. And then the room itself would be packed with people listening to their witness statement. Um, my understanding is Mary went first. Now Mary really, um, she took her opportunity with both hands to lay it on the line as to how this was not just events happening in 1920, that there was a whole sequence of roads of history that had led to the year of 1920 and all the awful things that had happened, particularly in Cork. I felt that I wanted, before I started my evidence this morning, to thank the Commission and the American people first for the kindly reception we got, and to thank the Commission for its endeavour to help Ireland by getting at the truth. Plenty. There was food, corn and meat to the value of 15 million pounds a week sent out of Ireland. And if Ireland really had a government of its own and there was a scarcity of food, the first thing that government would do would be to close the ports and prevent the shipping of food. But England put her armed soldiers at the ports to keep them open and food to the value of 15 million pounds a week went out of Ireland. That would be nearly 60 million dollars a week went out of Ireland, while over a million people died of famine. She was very, very forceful in talking about um, what had happened to her brother and giving details about uh, what they had endured and really how unfair and uneven handed Britain's handling was of them as a family, but also of the Irish question generally. They said she was an able speaker, very articulate, uh, very clear in her delivery. Her diction was uh, exceptional. Very passionate, of course, which brings people in, in with them. Um, great, great story in terms of the history of Ireland that she wanted to get across. In the spring of 1914, we started this woman's side movement, common the mon, as I have said, like Red Cross work. And we trained the minds of the people to know what the Republican movement meant. But our chief work was to support the Irish volunteers by every means possible in the fight for the independence of Ireland. But where she was wonderful at was um, this, um, you know, holding back the shoulders. You can almost see her the head up. And when the hecklers started or when, you know, awkward questions came from the floor, the teacher in her came out and she just thought, I've seen it all before, boys, in my classes. I know how to deal with you. <laughs> and on she took them, you know. I do not like to ask favours for anything they need. But I would like to remind you that the first ship to reach America bearing food in your dire extremity came from Ireland. And I should like to ask Americans to take care that during the coming winter, which is apt to be very hard in Ireland, to see to it that the women and children do not suffer. The men can suffer, and the women can suffer. But it is very hard to see the children suffer. And we do not want our people to be so oppressed by hunger and cold that their spirits can be broken and that they can be forced to surrender. She knew her own mind as she thought it and she had her own road and she wasn't going to waver or water it down for anybody.
the Republican groups back in Ireland took full advantage of the American Commission meeting and, and what they did was uh, documented all their grievances, they gave their testimony, witness testimony, fulfilled all the criteria that the Commission asked of them and the Commission found itself inundated with eyewitness accounts, accounts of atrocities, um, statements of what was going on in Ireland, so they suddenly realised that their work was not any of any finite limit. They realised that there was a whole story going on in Ireland and they were in this for the long haul themselves. The commission was compiled by Albert Coyle. When published in 1922, it consisted of 1,100 pages of testimony. My grandfather was Albert Freeman Coyle of Welsh and Irish descent. He was born in California in 1891. Albert was a polished writer with degrees from both Stanford and Yale universities. These skills and the connections got him the job as secretary for the American Commission. He took shorthand notes during testimony in Washington, D.C., and then compiled the report. My grandmother, Margaret Kennedy Coyle, was his typist for the project, and my father, Donald Coyle, was born during the same time. The Commission was able to really uh, introduce the reprisal mentality of the British government to first an American audience, but then a broader international audience. And the proceedings were uh, reprinted and they were spread out, they were disseminated worldwide through the Irish diaspora. Through that, they bring pressure onto the British government to end this policy of reprisals in Ireland. What you have to look at is the end result. The end result was that the story of the atrocities, they were believed, and second of all, there were funds that were badly needed, and they were part of the fundraising that went on. So they were very formidable women, actually extraordinary women in a very difficult time. Out of the American Commission came an American Relief Committee, and they raised over $5 million for the Sinn Féin movement back in Ireland and also a relief fund for those that were you know, suffering as a result of uh, shootings and things back in Ireland. The witness statements, they attempted to use them to change the British views. I don't know how successful they were in that, but what I would say is that it was another road that was to contribute towards bringing the British to the negotiating table eventually. The 1916 proclamation guaranteed religious and civil rights for all citizens of the Republic. These testimonies, the people who travelled to America, were actioning that right. They wanted the world to know that they had the right to their civil self-determination, and that self-determination had been exhibited in the 1920 general election. And so the lessons for us today are that democracy matters, that the will of the people matters, that voting matters, that taking part in your society matters. Just as they travelled to America, just as they fought in the War of Independence, we're grateful for those in history who did take part, who did change our lives, and who did share their stories with people across the world, which helped the cause at the end of the day. Martian, Queenie Mish Ernadini a Glockport, a Goganisir Shan Shan Aaron, Agus Denimit Kamora or Hukabrodul. Tommy Boyak, Asnadini, a Hashtal Trasna Gadina Stajenta, Kanishkelta, a Nochtu, Kan an Ufosh, a Nochtu, Agastan Dakimade Gwinganish, and Dakimade Priva, Agastami Fear of Wakashin, Tommy Dexul, Letauki, Shiakanta, Lahaik Gach, Illa, Seranak, Dantir.